First, uh, let me welcome you to this uh, press conference. We are now less than three weeks to 1st of June. The circuit breaker measures have shown promise in reducing COVID-19 infections locally in the community. The number of new cases in the community has uh, continued to fall from an average of over 30 case new cases daily in mid-April to eight new cases daily in the past week. The situation in the migrant worker dormitories is also stabilizing from a high point of an average of more than 1,000 new cases per day in late April to an average of about 700 cases per day in the last week. Since 5th of May, some of the circuit breaker measures have been progressively lifted. From today, we have further eased some of these measures by allowing some businesses to resume operations. This includes TCM medicine halls, manufacturing and, uh, and, uh, manufacturing and on site preparation of food, opening of uh, some retail outlets for takeaway and uh, delivery, and opening of uh, barbers and hairdressers, among others. By 1st June, if all goes well and the number of new cases of infection continues to be low, we hope to roll back more measures so that we can allow more economic activities as well as social activities to be restored. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has played your part to help to bring down the numbers and keep our fellow Singaporeans safe. But we must not be lulled into complacency or let our guards down. As we gradually lift the circuit breaker measures, there is a risk that the community cases may rise again. This has been the experience of many countries which have seen a second wave on infections after relaxing their social distancing measures. Therefore, we need to be very careful, remain vigilant and minimise the risk of any sharp rise in cases or large clusters in the community. Even as we progressively ease some of the tighter measures, other measures uh, will remain, such as safe distancing and safe management at our workplaces. The multi-ministry task force will share some of our plans in due course. To open safely, we will also need to have a way to manage the dormitory cases and allow the workers to return to work in a safe way when some of the economic activities are restored. The task force has drawn up a plan to allow migrant workers residing in the dormitories, including both the uh, purpose-built dormitories as well as uh, factory-converted dormitories to be progressively cleared so that they can safely return to work when the time comes. Our aim is to make sure that as far as possible, all migrant workers are free of infection before resuming work when their sectors gradually reopen. This will involve a differentiated approach and a combination of assessment, tests and isolation process. This is an important strategy that will help us gradually lift the circuit breaker measures. But it would mean that the number of cases at the migrant worker dormitories will remain high for some time while we carry out aggressive testing. It is important for us to stay vigilant, press on with our safe distancing measures even as we progressively open up and maintain our good habits of personal hygiene and wearing masks whenever we are out. If every one of us play our part, we can keep the number of new cases low and return to normalcy, albeit at a new normal. Thank you. I'll now ask uh, Director of Medical Services, Professor Kenneth Mark, to give a quick update on today's uh, medical uh, situation. Thank you, Minister. As of the 12th of May, 20, uh, 2020, 12 p.m., the Ministry of Health has preliminarily confirmed an additional 884 cases of COVID-19 infection in Singapore. Uh, the vast majority of these uh, were in work permit holders residing in foreign worker dormitories. We have three cases uh, who are Singaporeans or permanent residents. We're still working through the rest of the details and further updates will be shared via the MOH press release that will come up later tonight. Uh, thank you. I'll ask uh, Minister Lawrence Wong to say a few words. Um, good evening. We are steadily making progress in controlling the outbreak, both in the community as well as in the migrant worker dormitories. And that's why now we are planning for the next phase when the circuit breaker period ends on the 1st of June. 
with regard to the community figures, I think um, you can see the progress from the daily reports that we put out. The figures are steadily coming down. Our surveillance shows that the undetected cases in the community is also coming down. So there is progress made. The reproduction rate of the virus in the community is coming down. And we are in a good position to start thinking about possible easing of some of the restrictions beyond 1st of June. But we will do, do, do so in a very cautious and calibrated manner. For the situation in the migrant worker dormitories, um, the, we are making progress in clearing, testing the workers. We are committed to testing all the workers to make sure that they are free from infection. If you look at the actual numbers of people who report sick with acute respiratory illness, that number has been coming down by the day compared to the peak of the outbreak. But Every day, in terms of the reported cases, you will still see high numbers. And that's because we are continuing to test many workers, including the ones who are asymptomatic and well. Because this is part of our process to clear the dormitory systematically. So we have put in place a process to do so through mass PCR test and mass serological test. The serology test will be applied to the dorms with high infection rates. So with a serology test, we will be able to pick up those that test positive, meaning to say they have had some history of the illness, they probably have recovered. And after a period of isolation, we can assume that they are recovered uh, from the virus. For those who test negative for serology, and for the workers in the other dormitories, then we will apply the PCR test. And we will do this either individually or in batches, meaning through pool testing. Uh, today, we are testing about 3,000 tests a day in the dormitories, but we are ramping up that number over the coming weeks as well. So through mass PCR test and complemented or combined with isolation because one test alone may not be sufficient. We will do a one negative test and because the PCR test does not pick up the virus when it's in incubation, one test negative, the worker will be subject to a 14-day isolation and then another second negative test to be confirmed. So that's the kind of systematic process we are putting in place to test every worker verify their status, and then eventually clear the dorm systematically. And because we are doing that, despite the new cases coming down, the, the daily reported cases will be quite high for some time because this is a process of systematically clearing the dorms and we may well test an existing worker who is positive but asymptomatic. But this is necessary in order to ensure that we are thorough and systematic in cleaning up and clearing the dorms and, 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 and verifying the status of all the workers before they resume work. In the meantime, I think it's also very encouraging to see that many workers are recovering well on the, well on the road to recovery and many are ready for discharge. So by the end of this month, we will have 20,000 who are ready for discharge and then Likewise, in June, we expect to see many more uh, be recovering and well on their way to discharge, being discharged and being able to resume work as well. So all that, I think, is coming together just as we ease on the restrictions of the circuit breaker and reopen the economy. So we are now in a good position to plan forward and ease some of the restrictions, open more, um, uh, allow more workers to resume work, beyond the 1st of June, and then gradually take steps to reopen the economy. Uh, as we go about this exercise, all of us have to be prepared that new cases may well emerge. Uh, it's inevitable, right? The rep reproduction rate of the virus may be low today, but once more activities were to resume, uh, there may well be more contact, 
and we may see new cases emerging. It has happened in many other countries as well. So what's critical if this were to happen is to ensure that we have the ability to detect the new cases quickly and to prevent one case from forming large clusters. And that's why we are building up our capacity for faster contact tracing, for more comprehensive large-scale testing. And with these enablers, we will be able to have some confidence uh, in opening the economy and easing the circuit breaker measures. Thank you. Now, questions from the floor. Thank you, panelists. We will now begin with the Q&A. Members of the media, please remember to use the raise hand button if you would like to ask a question. We will only take one question from each person to allow for more to participate. Please keep your question short and concise. May we have the first question from Timothy from Straits Times? Timothy, Hi, please. Thank you, Hi, thank you, ministers. Um, I'd like to ask, as you mentioned, community numbers have been down, and uh, can we expect the circuit breaker to be lifted on 1st June as planned with schools reopening? And is there a specific timeline or set of dates for when each sector, for example, entertainment outlets, religious services will be open? A specific timeline. Thank you. I should uh, caution that uh, even as we approach the 1st June, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we do not expect by 1st June we will open everything and everything go back to normal and we begin to celebrate and have parties. I think we need to do so in a very uh, calibrated, very careful way because we have seen experiences in other countries where it is open, where everybody go back to celebrate uh, new cases emerge, new clusters em emerge. So I think we will need to do so in a very calibrated way. I think more details, uh, we will share more details uh, probably sometime uh, next week closer to uh, 1st June and how we intend to open it uh, gradually, progressively and cautiously and what are the economic sectors or uh, businesses will be involved in restarting some of these activities. Many of them will involve uh, more essential services that are quite critical to keep the economy going and to keep uh, uh, a life as normal as possible. I think uh, we will share more uh, probably sometime next week. Maybe uh, Lawrence have anything to add? Yes, you asked whether there is a timeline for these different sets of opening, and the answer is we, we won't be able to specify that up front. I think for now, we plan on one step in potentially at the end of the circuit breaker on 1st of June, one step, a cautious, calibrated easing. As we have already said, you know, the activities that encourage crowds, that have uh, close contact, you can be sure that will not be in the first step, right? But exactly when some of these activities can, be, um, can, can start, can, I think that will depend on the conditions. So we will set out a roadmap, if you will, starting with the first step, but also potential subsequent steps depending on the situation with the spread of the virus. So if we do the first step, we continue to monitor and the numbers do not spike up, the virus situation remains under control, and we have some confidence in all the measures we have put in place, then we can do the next step, and then so on and so forth. So that will be the way we operate uh, beyond the uh, once the circuit breaker ends. We will try to sketch out uh, uh, our overall plan, and the plan will involve uh, multiple phases, multiple steps. We can't do it in one step, and uh, the progress uh, in terms of timing and in terms of the extent of the opening will also depend on the um, number of cases after the first step. If we have a big surge of cases right after the first uh, step of opening, of course then the progress will have to be slowed down. And they may be, it may become necessary for us to in reintroduce some of the circuit breaker measures to ensure that we keep the, continue to keep the numbers low. So therefore, one very important uh, factor in this uh, uh, opening up post uh, 1st June is to continue to, with our efforts in safe distancing. And many of these measures that we have put in place are very effective, and that is why we are seeing lower, significantly lower community cases today. And once we open up, many of these safe distancing measures must continue so that we will ensure that the number of cases will remain low 
And if the number of cases can remain low despite the first step of opening, then we can probably go ahead with the second step in a, uh, in a bolder way, in a faster pace. So the pace and the extent depends on what happens uh, in terms of the infection transmission after we started the process. So I think we have to watch as we go along. Thank you, Ministers. The next question is from Cheryl from CNA. Cheryl, please. Hi, good evening. Um, I would like to ask about the ramping up of tests. Um, also, with, with uh, you said you're going to test all the workers in the dorms. Where are we getting the test kits? Where is our supply? Are we taking it locally from the manufacturers here? Or are we importing? Or is it a mix of both? And are we dealing with any potential shortage given that there are some materials around the world that uh, there may be a shortage of test kit materials around the world? Thank you very much, Cheryl, for that question. Uh, we have a strategy of diversifying uh, our testing uh, resource uh, where we procure, and uh, this is uh, precisely because of the reasons you have uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, there are many countries who are testing, and not only testing, also ramping up their test capacity at the same time as we are, and we all have uh, a common interest of wanting to test more uh, people within our own communities, and therefore there it will be inevitably some competition for resources. And this is the reason why we want to diversif diversify where we would procure our various test uh, kits and test resources. Some of the test kits we have come from local uh, 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 companies who are able to produce these uh, test kits. Uh, some of this, in fact, have, um, have been facilitated by our uh, strong research uh, uh, um, partners, including ASTAR. Uh, but we also procure from other uh, sources, uh, from other parts of the world, uh, uh, including uh, China, Korea, and other places as well. We've also uh, tried to reduce our dependency on various types of uh, steps within the uh, test stream, because each step uh, uses reagents, and sometimes these reagents themselves may be in potentially short uh, 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 supply. Uh, and this includes, for example, RNA extraction kits. And therefore, there are also some uh, tests that uh, circumvent the need for some of these uh, reagents, therefore uh, helping to avoid uh, uh, some of the constraints associated with um, competition and, and limited supply. And these are uh, some of the strategies we have to make sure that we have sufficient test capacity, not only for our current needs, but continuing to expand that capacity for our future needs as well. Thank you, panellists. The next question is from John from Reuters. John, please. Uh, thank you, panellists. Um, one quick question of, of clarification. So you've mentioned that you're going to test all of the workers in the dormitory. So that's all 324,000 workers. Over what period um, will you be doing that? And, and another question, and this has been asked before, but now you have a, a better sense of kind of that this uh, situation in the dormitories is, is stabilizing and um, you know, presumably you've done some scenario planning here. Um, what percentage of these 324,000 do you anticipate will have tested positive for coronavirus by the time you uh, get out of all this and have tested them all? Thank you. Um, the answer to the first question, it's... Uh, we are putting in place a, a plan, and it's already being implemented, as I said, to do in parallel mass serology tests and PCR tests. Uh, we think it will take several weeks um, to clear the dormitories, all 300 plus thousand workers. The timeline also depends on the outcome of these tests. And it goes back to your second question. We don't know what the underlying prevalence rate is today. No one knows. We do know, based on the infected cases, that we, the existing prevalence rate is about 6 plus percent. Right? That's based on the number of workers infected over the base of the population. It's 6 over percent. What is the true underlying prevalence rate? 
we will not know until we complete the test. And if it is low, then maybe it can be cleared faster, right? But if it is high and then you have people who need to be isolated, quarantined, then it may be, it, it will take more steps. So again, it depends on the situation. As we go about this, from time to time, you may see one day a sudden surge in cases and that's because when we do these sweeps of the dorms, we realize that there is a high incidence of infected cases. And then after a few days, you find that the numbers drop because as we do these uh, active case findings, we find that there are very little cases in these dorms, in other dorms. So it's really uh, that kind of a discovery exercise that's happening now when we go through these systematic tests of every dormitory. Right? So that's the process. And at the end of the day, we will have a better picture. But today, we don't quite know. And that's why we are doing it dorm dormitory by dormitory. I think it, it should, we should bear in mind also that the, each dormitory's uh, prevalence rate, uh, infection rate, also differs from dormitory to dormitory. And therefore, as we uh, mount our screening exercise, testing exercise for different dormitories, you may come up with a different test outcome uh, for different days. So as um, Minister Wong explained, in some days they are high. It's not because that today we have a lot of infection, but because today we discovered, particularly in this particular dormitory that we are testing, there are more numbers of uh, infection that we uh, uh, through our test for this day. So instead of looking at the number of cases from day to day, we should look at the overall trend because, part, because it was going to be uh, decided, determined by the uh, uh, testing strategy that we adopt. And sometimes you come to come across a dormitory that has very low infection rate and therefore the reported number of cases for that particular day may be lower, but there's also no cause for celebration because the next day, it happened to be a dormitory with high infection rate, you may end up with a high number. So it varies from day to day and to a large extent depends on the dormitory that we are uh, inspecting, that we are testing. So uh, it, it will have to, we have to bear that in mind as we look at the daily numbers that we announced. Thank you, Ministers. The next question is from Naveen from today. Naveen, please. Thank you, Ministers. The next question is from Naveen from today. Hi, Navini. Hi, this is Navini speaking from today here. I'd like to ask um, if you figured out what went wrong with the case of the false positives, what caused it, was it human error, and also what steps are being taken to ensure that it won't happen again? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, in fact, we continue to work with the laboratory to understand uh, all uh, that uh, had led to these false positive results being released. Our current understanding is that uh, um, that uh, some of these cases were discovered as a result of a quality assurance program put in place to check on the results coming out. And um, the test kit that was actually used on one of the machines uh, in one of these laboratories wasn't optimally calibrated. As a result, uh, the results uh, uh, that came out from that particular set of tests done uh, were not interpreted correctly. Uh, there were also uh, uh, some steps that uh, had not been completely followed through, uh, and if uh, those steps have been completely followed through, we might have perhaps uh, picked up some of these uh, results uh, a little bit earlier as well. Uh, so we're working with the laboratory to complete this quality assurance process. Uh, in fact, the laboratory has also uh, enlisted the support of the vendors that provide both the machine and the uh, test kits to support them in uh, making sure that the tests are now uh, properly done and optimised. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, confidence in the lab laboratory in being able to correct these uh, uh, processes uh, quickly and we are hopeful therefore that uh, uh, the, the laboratory can come back on stream uh, providing its full test capacity to allow us then to continue to test at the, the desired rate that we want uh, to meet our uh, uh, strategy as articulated by Minister just now. Thank you DMS. The next question is from Shwemi from CCTV. Shwemi please. Hi, ministers. Uh, it's nice to see the Mr. Lawrence Wang have the air cut in the first reopen days. <laughs> and we, <laughs> we know now the many countries is discussion to open, limited open the borders to each other. And my question is, how about in Singapore? And did you, uh, is on schedule or not discuss the details planning yet? Thanks. 
Um, first of all, I didn't have a haircut. I didn't go to the barber. Um, you can now, but please don't rush to the barber today. There is no need. You have plenty of time. They will be open. Um, hair was cut by my wife at home. <laughs> um, the borders, the, we are continuing to discuss with countries this situation of whether or not there can be um, travel between countries with um, controls and um, safeguards in place. Uh, we've said before that the travel restrictions will continue to be reviewed and updated. Uh, and if there are sufficient precautions and safeguards, we will be prepared to work bilaterally with different countries or in, with a grouping of countries that are prepared to put in place similar safeguards, be it testing for pre-departure or testing upon arrival. Uh, these are possible safeguards that can be done. And then if these sorts of safeguards are put in place and agreed upon, potentially we can have um, green lanes uh, for travellers to travel between countries. So these are discussions that are happening and we continue to um, work with uh, like-minded parties to see if some of these potential arrangements can be put in place. I think I can add that uh, uh, in these discussions, all countries are quite mindful and quite careful that we have to ensure that it's safe for us to have these uh, 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 exchanges. So therefore, I think it's important for us to put in place safeguards, <clears throat> both locally in our own country as well as in the uh, partnering countries if we were to establish uh, these uh, 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 arrangements. So I think it will involve both uh, in terms of uh, the infection rates in the respective countries we also look at the precautions that we have put in place and the effectiveness of many of these uh, infection control measures, safe distancing measures, as well as uh, a test uh, regime and so on. So I think there are multiple factors that we will take into account to ensure that even if you were to open up in a limited way uh, our, our border exchanges, uh, it has to be done so in a safe way. Thank you, Ministers. The next question is from Fatin from Barita Haryan. Hi, um, I would just like to ask, in light of Hari Raya coming up next week, will the government look into easing certain restrictions or providing certain, uh, making certain provisions to allow um, immediate family members to visit their parents or the elderly? Thank you. Well, that's one of the things we are studying um, as we think about what can be done in terms of easing of restrictions post or beyond 1st of June. Um, we haven't come to a decision, so as I said, the whole package of measures that can be done, be it reopening of some work premises or some of these restrictions around social interactions, uh, we will announce them when we are ready. But we are, for the part where it comes to visiting our family members, we are watch studying this very carefully because we are indeed, we, we recognize that many people would like to visit their family members. Many parents and grandparents miss their children and grandchildren. So while we would like to allow them to see one another, it, you know, it's not the same when you just do virtual um, video calls or phone calls. I think many want to be physically connected again, and we understand the desire to do so. We have to be quite cautious in moving on such a measure, particularly when it comes to the elderly, because we all know that they are vulnerable. And if they were to um, catch the virus, the disease is potentially lethal for them. So we are considering this quite carefully. And if when we are ready, depending on, again, the our assessment of risk of where the local community situation is in terms of the spread of the virus at that time, then we will make a decision on how much of an easing we can or cannot do, uh, particularly for visiting our family members. Thank you, Minister. The next question is from Evgeny from Aitartas. 
Evgeny, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to ask, uh, when do you plan to remove restriction uh, on entry to Singapore for foreigners leave working parts holder, holders and their family members? Can we expect that it will be uh, after June 1st or it will be, it takes longer time? Thank you. Um, there is, so pass holders are allowed to come in, but the numbers are regulated, right? That's why we, are, we, we regulate and the flow and the people coming in, there needs to be an approval process before pass holders, long-term pass holders and their dependents can return uh, to Singapore. So that is still regulated today. Um, because when you come back, we need to have sufficient quarantine facilities to ensure that these returnees serve out their 14-day um, self-isolation period. So we, depending on our capacity, depending on the situation at that time, we may increase the numbers, but it will still be a regulated flow. We will not open up in an unregulated manner. Thank you, Minister. The next question is from Karishma from BBC. Hi, yeah, um, thanks, panelists. I I'm interested in finding out, you know, how you compare the two infection rates. You'd said earlier that there's six percent spread in the foreign worker dorms that you can see at the moment. In the community, it's obviously much lower. Do you have a percentage for that? And why do you think there's such a big wide gap between these two infection rates? Um, I don't have the figure in the, but, um, for the community infection rate, but if you just look at the f actual numbers, we have so far, what, 1,000 plus, 2,000? 1,000 plus infected cases in the community. And you divide it, you divide that by the base of the population, then obviously it's a very low infection rate. And, uh, and that's why we've been explaining that this is a situation where we are tackling the outbreak on two fronts. It's uh, an infection that's spreading in the community and an infection that's spreading amongst the foreign worker dormitories because of the characteristics of these dormitories uh, in a different way. And, and, and we, because it's different, the settings are different, and that's why we do need separate strategies. That's what we've been explaining, that there are two infections that we are dealing with, and we have a, two separate set of strategies to deal with the infection in the community, as well as the outbreak in the dormitories. Uh, and as we are explaining today, for the community cases, you see the circuit breaker measures working, for the dormitory cases, the situation is stabilizing, but the numbers, the reported numbers will still be high every day because of what we are doing to clear the dorms systematically. We should also bear in mind that uh, the dormitory is like a household, and you can see that even in the community cases, uh, when it comes to household infection, the transmission rate is much higher because they will live together, they um, share their food, and they have uh, spent time together. So I think uh, in the dormitory situation, it is very much like a large household, and therefore the transmission rate is likely to be higher than in the uh, open community. And uh, particularly in today, we have uh, social distancing and uh, circuit breaker measures in the community, and therefore the transmission rate would slow down quite significantly within the community. Thank you, ministers. We now have time for the last three questions. The next question is from He Ai from Wan Pao. He Ai, please. Um, hello. Hi. Um, can I just check? Uh, uh, hold on. Okay, so um, can I just clarify? The testing of all workers, right? Does it refer only to those who are staying in dorms? So the 32K. So does it not include the 60K who are living outside the dorms? So if that's the case, right? How many percentage of workers are already tested? And how many percentage of uh, factory confident dorms have we actually cleared with testing? So then, uh, since you know it mentioned that you take weeks to clear everyone, so how would we prioritize the testing? Would certain workers from certain sectors be uh, tested first? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
So far, we have tested more than 32,000 workers in the dormitories. So if you look at the base of um, 300 plus thousand in dormitories, that's about 10%. And then we have another remaining 90% to go. It's, I said weeks, it could go beyond weeks. It could, it, I mean, it could go through June, July. Like I said, it's the plan to do so is in place. We are already carrying this out. How fast or slow we can do this depends on many, many factors. If we are able to ramp up our testing capacity, which we are already doing, for example, and let's say by the end of this month, we can double our testing capacity, then certainly it helps us to speed up the process of testing every worker in the dormitories. And then, like I said, depending on the outcome of the test, depending on whether or not you need to isolate, quarantine the workers, then again, all of these will um, determine the speed at which we can um, clear the dormitories. Because it's not just testing, we are also putting in place testing and isolation. Right? So there is a whole range of um, processes put in place to make sure that the worker is free from infection before we release them to the workforce. Are we, we are not doing this sector by sector. Bear in mind that the workers in the dormitories are largely construction, marine and process workers. That's, I mean, and, and in fact, of, of these three sectors, a large majority are construction. Right? So there is, we are not doing it sector by sector, but we are certainly doing it uh, systematically, dormitory by dormitory. And it's happening even as we speak across the large purpose-built dormitories and also the factory converted dormitories. Uh, beyond this one-time clearing of the dormitories, eventually when the workers resume work, including the workers who live outside the dormitories, we will continue to put in place a regular regime to test the workers on a regular basis. Because we do not want to have a recurrence of uh, clusters forming amongst construction workers in particular, now that we have identified this as an activity um, that could potentially result in large clusters forming. Right? So we will put in place a regular regime of testing. So that will also apply not just to workers living in the dormitories, but workers who are now serving their stay-home notice requirements, living outside dormitories. Because if you remember, the construction workers living outside dormitories are now on a stay-home requirement. So they are isolated at home. Eventually, they will come out as well. And as they start work, we will also uh, be testing them. Thank you, Minister. The next question is from Irshad from Temo Murasu. Irshad, please. Hi, good evening, ministers. Uh, my question goes out uh, regarding Singaporeans who are still overseas. Um, I suppose there was a big uh, volume of uh, Singaporeans who are returning from other countries. Uh, what is the status uh, currently and what arrangements are made for people who are still stranded in overseas? Because I understand there are Singaporeans in India who do not have any flights back until the end of this month. And then my next question would be uh, the status of work pass holders who are in um, the various sectors in Singapore, uh, what if their passes are going to expire or have expired during this phase? Uh, will it be automatically renewed for them? Thank you. I think for the Singaporeans that are still stranded overseas, um, uh, I will encourage them to stay in touch with our uh, mission overseas. So whenever we are able to arrange a flight uh, and with the uh, respective governments, we will try our best to bring them back so we don't want to leave any Singaporeans behind. And so please get in touch with our mission so that we meet, our mission knows where you are. And if you are uh, keen to come back to Singapore, let the mission know so that the first opportunity where we are able to arrange a flight to bring you back, we will try to do so. MFA is working very hard with the respective uh, uh, governments in other countries to see whether we are able to mount uh, these flights to bring them back. So I think uh, the best thing to do is to stay in touch so that we can make the necessary arrangement. But to a very large extent, it also depends on the rules and regulations 
of the respective governments is something that uh, it's beyond our control. Uh, we are continuing to discuss and to negotiate with them and to see whether we can bring back Singaporeans as soon as possible. We do want them to come back if they, if they wish to come back and we want to do so as soon as possible. On the work pass, yeah. Um, the work pass, if there are workers whose passes um, are expiring during this period, then they approach the companies can approach or the workers approach mom for an extension or for um, renewal of the passes mom will treat this like any other renewal exercise it's no different whether it's just because of COVID-19 uh, there won't be any different I mean they won't treat this any differently right so if there are reasons for the passes to be extended then it, they will be but if there are reasons why mom might take a different view for whatever uh, reasons um, based on the employer's record or the worker's record, then they might not be extended. So the same processes would apply when it comes to renewal of work passes. Thank you, Ministers. We will now take the final question from David from the new paper. David, please. Hi. Um, I have a question in relation to the 33 false positives. Um, I wanted to check how many of them were actually uh, foreign workers and how many were actually sent to community care facilities before the retest for their uh, well, retest results came back negative. Uh, yeah. I, I don't have information uh, specifically on this uh, right now. What, what we'll do is try and see if we can get the relevant information out. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I just don't have it here with me, so I can't uh, answer that question today. 